Lecture 10a. In this lecture, we will describe the logic of a simple experiment. Explain null hypothesis statistical testing for two samples. Explain some of the reasonings for determining degrees of freedom. And distinguish between independent sample designs and paired samples designs. The basics of an experiment are that you're going to start with two equivalent groups. Equivalent meaning that they're similar on the dependent variable of which you're interested. Then you're going to treat them exactly alike except for one thing. After that, you measure both groups so that you can attribute any statistically significant difference between the two groups on that dependent variable in the way in which they were treated differently. So you start with the population, and then you create two groups. Now the, the way that it's, this is usually ensured is by doing a, a random assignment or a random selection, depending on how you're getting them from the population, into those two groups. Then one group undergoes the particular treatment, while the other group has nothing, and then finally, you measure them. And there are tons of variations on this design. I mean, you can have more than two groups. You can have more than two treatment conditions, like a treatment condition, a treatment two condition, and a control. Um, you could, instead of randomly selecting them into groups, you could stratify them by gender into groups. Um, you could have a pretest and then a post test. Basically, what I'm trying to say is this really is the, the basic logic of an experiment. Now I've mentioned the, the term independent, rather dependent variable already as the thing that we measure, but the independent variable, one of the things I want you to realize is that the independent variable is usually the thing that you group stuff on, and it can also be the thing that you treat them differently on. The number of in the levels of the independent variables will always end up being the number of groups that you actually have in your design. So let's take an example where, say I wanted to test the effects of um, some sort of a motivation course. So I want to measure motivation. So that makes motivation my dependent variable. But what I'm interested in is the effects on different genders, so males versus females, of a particular um, type of course. So maybe we have a team training course, we have an individual course, and then we have a control group that gets no sort of motivational training. Sorry, my handwriting is so bad. It's a little tough on this particular um, stylus that I'm using. So what this would look like design-wise is that first we would stratify by gender. So we would take our participants and we would separate the males from the females. And since we're interested in the difference of these effects on males versus on females, each of these groups is then further split into three separate groups where the group one for the males would be the team training, and then group two would be the individual training, and then group three would be a control, and then you'd have the same things for the females, team, individual, control. So you'd actually end up with six groups, so six levels of the independent variable. You'd have male, team, male, independent, male, control, and then the same things for the females. Each of these groups would get measured on some sort of dependent variable measure of motivation. And then you could take their average motivation. So I would have like an X bar for the male team, an X bar for the male individual X bar. So you'd end up with six sample means. All right, so that's just kind of an example of how complex you can get an experiment and the relationship between independent variables and their levels and dependent variables.
So let's do a couple of examples together just to make sure that we can identify the IV independent variable and DV dependent variable. And then if there are levels of the independent variable of, of note to, to take a look at them. I also want to just kind of play around with stating some null hypotheses here in anticipation of the, um, the full experimental design that we're going to actually finally get to in this particular chapter of the SPETS. So a 1957 article in the Journal of Experimental Psychology described the kind of dreams that are reported when you wake a person during REM sleep or at other times during non-REM sleep. Vivid dreams tend to come from the REM sleep stage and no dreams are vague dreams from the non-REM stage. So what kind of independent variable and dependent variable could they have been measuring? Well, yeah. the thing they're checking to see the difference in between is the type of dream. So the dependent variable would be type of dream. And there are lots of classification. They talked about vivid versus vague or no dream states. Um, and I would imagine that they could go even further and maybe quantify it saying on a scale of 1 to 10, how vivid was your dream? How, how much do you remember from your dream? With 10 being the most vivid and 1 being the least, so that you could actually get an average dream rating, I guess, or I'm sure they could define it somehow instead of type of dream, but intensity of dream or something along those lines. The independent variable would be during which type of sleep. And we know that we can measure that um, based on the rapid eye movement, right? So type of sleep, and they're calling there's two levels. So the this is the independent variables, type of sleep. And there are two levels. There's REM and non-REM. So the null hypothesis, what we're doing is we're comparing the independent variable levels on the type of dream. So that we would say that there's no difference between the average intensity of dream for those in the REM group when compared to those in the non-REM group. That would be an appropriate null hypothesis. An alternate hypothesis could just be one of two-tailed significance, or you could choose, if there's enough evidence already established, that you could have a one-tailed alternate saying that there's going to be more vivid dreams during REM sleep. So you could do a one-tailed hypothesis as well for an alternate. Next example. Brad gathered data on the effect of authority among college students. He had 24 students read and give a rating of quality on a scale of 1 to 7 to an abstract of a scientific article. For 12 students, the apparent author of the abstract was a person with a title of authority, like doctor or PhD. For the other 12, the apparent author's title was not one of authority, so either they left it off um, or some other condition where it's not known. I'm not sure what the specifics of the, the study were, but I can get enough information out of this little vignette to understand that they're somehow going to be measuring the quality. So they're rating a quality. And the quality is then the dependent variable because the hypothesis is that there is going to be a difference in that rating compared between um, when the person thinks the, the author had a title of authority versus had no title of authority, right? So my dependent variable is going to be quality rating. And it even gave us a scale of 1 to 7, right? And then the independent variable, we could just call it type of title. And then there are two levels where there's an authority and none mentioned. Okay, so the hypothesis might be that if the person has that those initials by their name, that authority associated with it, that um, the person who read it, the 24 students who read these ratings, might attribute a higher um, rating of qualities simply because they're assuming it's going to be higher 
uh, because the person has the credentials with their name. So it's an interesting approach. So null hypothesis would be that always a no statement of no difference. In the null hypothesis, there'd be no difference in quality rating. So because we could find an average quality rating for group one versus an average quality rating of group two, where one is the authority and two is the none mentioned, that those average quality ratings would be identical as a null hypothesis. There'd be no difference between the two. Pat's handwriting was terrible. Pat converted this long-standing problem into an independent project for his research methods class. The participants in his experiment graded an essay on a scale of 50 to 100. For 20 participants, the essay was written in terrible handwriting, his own, and for 20 others, the essay was written beautifully. So it's the same essay. The question is, is there a difference in the average grade? Um, the hypothesis being that people with neat handwriting are automatically graded with a uh, higher score simply because, I don't know, the grader is happier. i got to be honest with you, I've always felt this was probably a true uh, phenomenon because there's so much subjectivity in grading, um, and a human being has emotions, and if I'm reading stuff that looks like crap, I'm not nearly as pleased off the get-go as if I, I can read the same words, but they look beautifully on the paper. It's just a matter of my own eye strain. So that'd be interesting to actually perform this study. Maybe I should do that in a future class. Regardless, the independent variable would be the type of handwriting. And there are two of the levels. And you can see how we could design this for a third level even, maybe where it's typed. So we have, oops, we don't have three this time though. So just two levels, um, bad and beautiful. And then the dependent variable, the thing they suspect might change as a result of that independent variable level is going to be the um, grade because the grade is being measured on a scale of 50 to 100. So there would be an average grade for the lousy handwriting, and we could compare it to the average grade for the beautiful handwriting. So an old hypothesis, statement of no difference, I know it's getting repetitive, but that's kind of the point, is that the in the population, then, the mean score for poorly handwritten assignments would be the same as those same content written beautifully. I think this one has a clear direction implied that the beautiful one might be uh, graded nicer than the not so beautiful one. So here are the steps for hypothesis testing. First thing you want to do once you've um, identified your independent and dependent variable and your design is set up, is that you want to start with your logical hypotheses. And logical means that they make sense not only to you instinctively, but um, if you're doing real research, it makes sense within the context of the existing body of literature. So you write those hypotheses first, right? Then second, assuming that there is no difference. So you're assuming that there's that there's going to be no difference between the two or three or four groups, however many you have. Um, you're going to assume there's no effect and decide on an alpha level. And remember, usually that alpha level is 0.05. You could adjust that alpha if the consequences of committing a false positive were particularly grave, like in a medical test or something like that. All right, then you're going to choose an appropriate statistical test. So far, we've really only learned about t-tests, there are other ones down the road in your intermediate courses you may or may not take, um, like ANOVAs, ANCOVAs, MENOVAs. They all have these pithy little acronyms um, that stand for things like um, analysis of variance, analysis of covariance, multiple analysis of variance, multiple analysis of covariance, and there's, there's more and more and more. All right, so once you've chosen that statistical test, you're going to calculate the actual test value. So that's what we've been doing when we calculate the t-test statistic. All right, then use your appropriate tools to evaluate the test value. That's usually for us, it's always going to be table D, um, which or table C, depending on the test um, 
where we look to see if the test value exceeds the critical values. And then you make your decision. Is there enough evidence to reject the null, or must you retain it or fail to reject the null? And then, just to make sure that you understand the difference between statistical significance and practical significance, you're going to calculate an effect size index. Even if you do retain the null, um, SPATS has you always calculating the effect size index. And then finally, you write a conclusion that's supported by that particular data analysis. All right, degrees of freedom. We've introduced degrees of freedom um, now for a couple of chapters, but now we're going to try and understand a little bit more about what they really mean. I want you to think of degrees of freedom as a indication of the mathematical limitations that we've imposed on certain things to calculate estimates. Um, remember way back when, when we learned how to calculate a standard deviation? One of the properties of the mean is that the deviations from the mean of, for all the numbers in the data set will always add up to zero. So it was a necessary evil so that we could get how the, um, how the data varied from the center, from the mean. We had to actually square those values um, to get a sum of squares of the, of the deviations, and then we unsquared it later with a square root. Well, the mean has a mathematical limitation, and that mathematical limitation is the fact that they add up to zero. Um, in degrees of freedom for this text, the main focus you're going to have is going to be based on the sample size. Now, for a one-sample t-test, the degrees of freedom are calculated using the sample size minus 1. For correlation coefficient, R, the degrees of freedom was n minus 2, because remember in that we have two sets of data. We have values for x and y, and they're paired, but they're separate data sets that then we calculate separate means for and standard deviations. So that ended up giving us a minus 2 for the degrees of freedom on n, where n is the number of pairs. All right, so what does freedom mean in this statement, degrees of freedom? Well, according to Spatz, he says, freedom of a number to have any possible value. So for example, if you're asked to pick three numbers, then each number you pick is free to vary, so you would have three degrees of freedom. Because if you say pick three numbers, period, you literally could mean somebody could pick 11,526 as their number. Um, but if you start to impose some limits on that, saying three numbers between 1 and 10, then you would actually end up with two degrees of freedom because you've imposed a limitation on what those numbers can be. If you said three different numbers between 1 and 10, that would reduce your degrees of freedom to 1. Okay, so just in summary, why do we use n minus 1 or n minus 2 instead of just n? It has to do with the restrictions built into the mathematical formulas. Um, for example, when we calculate variance, the deviations must add to zero. The sum of those deviations is zero. That's a limitation. And since we use variance to find standard deviation, which is needed to find the estimate of a population mean or a population standard deviation before the population mean, um, that limitation plays a role in our degrees of freedom calculation. So it's pretty theoretical. Um, I think what I would want you most to know is that there are different degrees of freedom for different types of tests, and it has to do with how many sets of data you're actually working with in your calculations when it boils down to it. Okay, final thing for Lecture 10A is types of designs. There are designs for two sample designs that the... Um, data sets can be considered to be independent from each other, so there isn't any crossover between the two samples. There are also paired sets of designs, where the scores are paired with another score, and this can happen because of natural pairs, matched pairs, or repeated measures. To me, the big giveaway that you're dealing with a paired design, especially when working through SPATS's problems, is that he tends to actually use the word paired <laughs> in his question prompt. So if you see that, be highly suspicious that it's going to be a paired design. Um, 
Also, if they have the same subjects used twice, that would make sense to do a paired design. So, for example, if you had um, 15 students who you give them a test on um, academic motivation, and then those 15 students go through some sort of motivation training, and you test them again, well, that's a paired design because the same students were tested twice. For independent, there just isn't a, a logical reason to pair the, store, the scores. And um, almost always you're talking about different, um, different people in each group. It's the reason why this matters is the degrees of freedom changes and the equations are different. So what I want to do is I want to practice identifying paired versus independent designs with a couple of examples here. And because of the examples, we can also then, I believe I've set it up so that we can identify the degrees of freedom as well. So remember, for degrees of freedom, we have, um, oops, definitely not in the corner where I thought I was. For a paired, the math ends up happening when you find the difference between the two sets of data. And so we actually are only working with one actual list of data when it's all said and done. And so that paired has a degrees of freedom of n minus 1, which is weird because I know you're thinking, oh, yeah, but wait, why did we have n minus 2 for the correlation data? Well, that was because we had two sets of data that had their own means and standard deviations we needed. In the paired designs, we subtract them, get a single list, and for that single list, we find its mean and standard deviation. Okay, That will become a little bit more evident in 10b. And for the independent, since we have two separate, we are going to actually take the sum of the two sample sizes and then subtract one for each, so minus two. These are the degrees of freedom calculations. All right, so first one, 13 volume volunteers weighed themselves before and after. All right, so keywords there is it's before and after the fast, and it's 13 volunteers that did it twice, There's the before and the after. So this is a logical paired design. So 13 minus 1 gives me 12 degrees of freedom. The first 10 persons who arrived for church service filled out a questionnaire on attitudes towards religion. The first 10 who were late for the service were spotted and after the service, how polite, um, they filled out the same questionnaire. So these are different people. It's the same number of them, but they are different people in the sets. So that means that we're going to have two separate sets of scores for attitudes towards religion, which makes us a good independent design. And even though we have 10 and 10, I'm still going to consider them 10 plus 10 and then minus 2. Or you can think of it as 10 minus 1 plus 10 minus 1. Either way, you get 18 degrees of freedom. Consumer testing group compared two types of detergent to determine which got stuff whiter. 20 sets of sheets that had been placed for 12 hours in a bathtub of mud, yummy, were washed and the amount of light reflected was measured with a photometer. Well, hey, there you go. At least it sounds like a scientifically valid um, experiment. Um, Let's see, so the idea is that they aren't really clear, so I'm going to make some a little bit of clarifications here. And I would imagine that if this were, like, say, a free response on, a, on an assignment, that as long as you clarified why your response was what it was, that it would be just fine in terms of grading. Um, I'm going to make the assumption that 20 sets of sheets have been placed for 12 hours, so they all got the same treatment of mud, but then they were split into two groups of 10 and 10, and half were watch, washed in the borax and half were washed in the tide, and then they were measured. So um, since the same sheets aren't actually undergoing it, it's not really a paired design. So I would call this an independent design um, with 18 degrees of freedom. Eight volunteers rated their emotionality in a large blue room and then in a small yellow one. Interesting. All right, so this is definitely a pair of design, gives it away because it's the same volunteers in both rooms. So 8 minus 1 is 7. The psychologist gave a pretest and matched, ooh, there's, a, there's a key word, matched each participant with another participant. Half were given amphetamine and half were given a placebo. 
all 40 participants then learned a new test, uh, a new task. And I'm going to make the assumption here that they were also given some sort of a post test. All right, so the idea being that they're matched off the pretest. So let's say uh, participant 1 and participant 7 on the pretest scored a 6 out of 10. That's why they were matched together, is because they were similar prior to any sort of treatment. So what's going to happen is then they're going to learn a new task, and um, the person who got stuck in the amphetamine group is going to score again, and maybe that person has a 4 out of 10, and the person who had the control placebo still scored a 6 out of 10. So it's really what we're interested in is the difference between these two, which means I'm just going to have one set of data, making this a paired design, um, and a paired design is going to look at these as two groups of 20, right, for a total of 40, Okay, so if n minus 1, n though is the number of pairs, not necessarily the total number of participants. Because when we subtract these, right, you see that we're going to end up with just one list of 20 scores, where this particular one would result in a difference of 2, and maybe another pair results in a difference of 7, and another pair results in a difference of 0. Or maybe even a negative, maybe the person who was amped up on some meth did better, I don't know. Um, but regardless, we're going to end up with 20 scores. And so our n is 20, and n minus 1 gives us 19. I can see how that one could have been um, particularly confusing. I'll try to make sure that the problems that we do in our next lecture and that show up on assignments are a little bit more clear in how the design is set up so that it's not quite as, okay, it could go this way or that way for you.